Hello, young soul. Welcome to the Daily Horror Channel. If you are afraid of real and scary reports, this channel is not for you. I suggest you leave this video. But if you are not afraid of listening to these horrifying reports, I suggest you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the next stories. In the village of Night Vale, hidden between forgotten mountains and covered by constant fog, an ancient legend ran through the mouths of the oldest residents. They told of the messengers, skeletal beings with eyes that glowed in the darkness, who roamed the empty streets after midnight. It was said that these messengers were none other than soul collectors, sent by an ancient and dark lord from another world. I, Tomas Alencar, have always been driven by curiosity and skepticism. As an investigative journalist, my search for the truth has taken me to various corners of the world, facing dangers and unraveling mysteries. However, nothing prepared me for what I would find in Night Vale. I arrived at the town on a gray afternoon, when the sun was struggling in vain to penetrate the blanket of fog that enveloped everything. The village seemed suspended in time, its stone houses covered in moss, and its cobblestone streets dimly lit by gas lamps that flickered in the impending darkness. I was received with a mixture of hospitality and distrust. The residents, with their wary looks, said little, but their whispers carried clear warnings. Don't go out at night, sir. The messengers don't like strangers. My first night in Night Vale was a real test of nerves. I decided to defy the warnings and investigate the streets after curfew. Armed with my camera and flashlight, I crept through the deserted streets feeling the weight of hundreds of invisible eyes on me. It didn't take long to hear the first signs of the messengers. The sound of chains dragging across cobblestone echoed through the alleys, followed by the faint glow of red eyes in the shadows. Hearts beating like drums in my ears, I continued, determined to find the truth. It was in Prasador Valho that I saw the first messenger clearly. It was a tall, bony figure wrapped in dark rags with eyes that burned like embers. His presence was both hypnotic and terrifying. I slowly raised my camera, a gesture that seemed to defy the very air around me, and took a photo. The click of the camera sounded like thunder in the silence. The messenger stopped, tilting his head as if confused by my audacity. It was then that a whispering voice filled the air, a voice that came from nowhere and everywhere at once. Why do you disturb the work of those who serve the Lord of the Vale? He asked. I swallowed hard, my voice little more than a whisper. I seek to understand, not disturb. Who is your Lord, and why do you collect souls? The answer came like a cold wind making the mist stir around me. Our Lord is ancient, as far as time. The collected souls are old debts, payments necessary to maintain the balance of this world and the next. In the following days I continued my investigation, discovering that the entire village was shrouded in a forgotten pact. Centuries ago, the first residents of Night Vale had made a deal with a shadow entity to ensure protection and prosperity. In return, they were to surrender the souls of the dead and, occasionally, that of a living person chosen by the Lord of the Vale. My stay in Night Vale culminated in a stormy night when I decided I needed to see the messengers one more time to fully understand the extent of this dark pact. Equipped with my camera and a growing sense of desperation, I set out into the rain that was falling heavily making the village streets even more enigmatic and dangerous. The mist and rain created veils that distorted the vision, but even so, the silhouettes of the messengers began to become visible, moving with purpose among the shadows. It seemed that the storm made them stronger, more daring. His eyes glowed with a more intense red light, cutting through the darkness like headlights. I followed cautiously, keeping my distance, when a flash of lightning lit up the sky, revealing the scene of a messenger standing next to one of the village's elderly residents. The old man didn't seem scared. Instead, there was a deep resignation in his eyes, as if he understood and accepted the fate that awaited him. The messenger reached out a skeletal hand, and the instant he touched the villager, his body seemed to dissolve into a dark mist that was absorbed by the messenger paralyzed by horror 
I barely noticed another messenger approaching me from behind. An icy hand touched my shoulder, and a cold voice whispered directly into my ear, making each word drip like ice through my veins. You don't belong here, outsider. Your soul is not in debt, but your presence here may alter the balance we maintain. Turning slowly, I faced the hooded figure, his face hidden in shadow except for the burning eyes that examined me. I just want to understand, not interfere, I said, my voice shaking with the cold and fear. Understanding is a burden and now you carry this weight, replied the messenger, releasing my shoulder. Go now and do not return. Tell the story if you wish, but know that the truth of the Night Vale is protected by deeper shadows than you can imagine. The message was clear. With a heavy heart and a tormented mind from what I had witnessed, I left Night Vale at dawn. The storm had passed and with it, the intensity of the last few nights seemed a distant memory, but the terror I felt was indelible. Arriving home, my determination to report the story of the Midnight Messengers only grew stronger. I documented everything I saw and learned, every detail of the shadowy figures and their fearsome deeds, every whisper of the darkness that now inhabited part of my own soul. The story was published, met with skepticism by many, but for those who knew the taste of true fear, it was a grim warning. Now far from the mist and darkness of Night Vale, I still feel the messengers' gazes in my dreams, hear their whispers on stormy nights. And although I never returned, I know that part of me was left behind, lost in the eternal shadows of that cursed village, where messengers walk and souls are harvested at the stroke of midnight. In the stillness of the nights following my return, the house in which I lived seemed permeated with an unnatural stillness. Darkness was not just the absence of light, but a palpable presence that curled around corners and crept under doors. In every shadow, I saw a glimmer of movement, a whisper of the messengers that seemed to follow me beyond the confines of Night Vale. One night, as the wind howled outside, as if mourning those lost, I decided to dig through my notes and recordings once again. The light from my desk cast a golden circle of safety around me, but beyond it shadows danced with an ominous intensity. Reviewing the interviews with the villagers and the photos I took of the messengers, I noticed that each image seemed darker than when I took them, as if something was fading from them, or, worse, emerging from them into my world. As I concentrated on the images, the temperature in the room dropped abruptly, a coldness that seeped into the bones and chilled the soul. Then I heard the sound, dragging currents, not through the recordings, but real and present, echoing through the hallway outside my office. My heart sped up, each beat resounding in my head like a war drum. Reluctantly, I looked up from the photos, staring at the open office door. There, in the shadows of the hallway, red eyes glowed, watching me with a fierce intensity. The skeletal figure of a messenger stood at the threshold, the chains on his hands dripping with darkness that stained the wooden floor like ink. You brought this with you. The whispering voice needed no wind to carry its chill up my spine. I swallowed hard, trying to find my voice. What do you want from me? My question, although asked with determination, trembled with the fear I felt. You saw what you shouldn't have. Now the story you carry is part of you, as you are part of it. You cannot leave Night Vale while carrying your shadows. The figure stepped forward, chains dragging ominously across the floor. Instinctively stepping back, I felt my back touching the cold wall. There was nowhere to run. How can I get rid of this? The question escaped my lips before I could stop it. You must return. Return what you took. Only then will the shadows recede, said the messenger, his figure beginning to fade like mist at dawn. Once the figure completely disappeared, the temperature in the room began to slowly rise, and the shadows retreated to mere benign outlines. I was alone again, but the terror of the visit remained, a reminder that some stories are too dangerous to tell, and that Night Vale still had a hold on me, a hold that exacted a price I had yet to pay. 
In the days that followed, I knew I would have no choice but to return to the dark village and face the messengers again. Night Vale's story was not over. She just expected me to fulfill my role in her, a role I inadvertently accepted by trying to reveal her darkest secrets. And as I prepared for the journey back, every shadow seemed to whisper a warning. Every whisper a promise that the true terror was yet to come. With a heavy heart and a tormented mind, I prepared myself for the return to Night Vale. The journey back seemed darker and more ominous than before. The trees along the path leaned under the weight of a cloudy sky, as if mourning my return to that cursed place. Upon arriving at the village, the thick fog enveloped me, welcoming me back into its icy, shadowy womb. I wasted no time, I knew what I needed to do. I headed directly to Praça do Orvalho, the place of my fateful encounter with the messengers. The square was deserted, shrouded in the gloom that precedes night. I placed the photos and notes in the center of the square, as if offering a sacrifice to the invisible lord of that place. So I waited. It wasn't long before the air became colder and a palpable presence filled the room. The messengers emerged from the shadows, their skeletal figures more defined in the flickering light of the streetlights. Their eyes glowed with an intense red light, watching my every move with relentless curiosity. One of them, the one who had visited me at my house came forward. His voice, a whisper that seemed to drag chains, broke the silence. You have returned to fulfill your destiny. I swallowed hard, facing the terror that consumed me. Yes, I return what I took. The stories of these souls do not belong to me. With a slow gesture, the messenger waved to the others who approached and began to collect the materials I had brought. As each photo and page was touched by them, it disintegrated, turning into ash that the cold wind dispersed. When everything was consumed, the messenger who was leading turned to me. You are free from the curse, but not from the knowledge. You will carry with you the shadows of what you learned forever, a reminder that there are truths in this world that are older and deeper than human understanding. No more words were said. The messengers retreated into the shadows, disappearing one by one until only I was left in the gathering darkness of the square. The feeling of relief was mixed with a deep sadness, a realization that although free, I would never fully escape the shadows of Night Vale. I left the village under cover of night, feeling the eyes of each messenger on my back, a silent reminder that my visit to Night Vale would always be a part of me. And as I drove back to my normal life, I knew that the stories I had tried to tell weren't just reports, they were warnings. They were lessons in the power of the unknown. And so, with the terror and suspense of that experience etched into my soul, I closed the Night Vale chapter of my life, aware that some doors once opened could never be completely closed. town of Thorn, the legend of the clock tower in the central square was intertwined with the daily lives of the inhabitants. Each chime echoed through the stone streets, marking the rhythm of the city that rarely saw sunlight shine through the heavy layers of fog. However, legend had it that every centenarian, the clock struck 13 times at midnight, and with each extra chime, a child disappeared without a trace. I, Edgar Linz, a librarian with a passion for ancient mysteries, had moved to Thorn attracted by its stories and secrets. The fascination with the clock and its legends quickly became the focus of my research. I explored dusty archives and interviewed elderly people who spoke of nights when the clock had chimed 13 times, distant gazes reflecting the fear and wonder of their youth. As the hundredth year approached, an air of tension began to grow in the city. Parents guarded their children at dusk, murmuring old stories as they cast nervous glances toward the clock tower that rose like a specter over Thorn. One night, driven by a mixture of fear and curiosity, I decided to watch the clock closely. 
Hiding in the shadow of an old bookstore, I watched the hours pass, each tick amplified by the silence that enveloped the empty square. As midnight approached, excitement and fear intertwined in my chest. The chimes began, each one resonating deep in my heart. One, two, three. Up to twelve, I held my breath, the seconds stretching out like hours, until the inevitable thirteenth chime broke the night. A sound that seemed more like a lament than an announcement of the time, bringing with it an icy wind that whistled between the alleys. At that exact moment, a sharp scream cut through the silence. It came from a side street, a sound so full of despair that my heart stopped. I ran toward the scream, my footsteps echoing against the pavement. There I found a woman kneeling, sobbing, the void beside her where, until that moment, her little daughter had been playing. In the days that followed, the city of Thorn was enveloped in a blanket of palpable fear. Children disappeared one by one every night, always with the thirteenth bell. Desperate for answers, I delved even deeper into the clock's mysteries. I discovered old diaries of a watchmaker who spoke of a pact, a debt of souls made to an entity forgotten by people but not by time. Armed with this knowledge, I knew the solution would require more than just understanding. I would need to face whatever was behind that pact. The next midnight I stationed myself at the base of the tower, murmuring ancient words found in the diaries, hoping to summon or appease the guardian of lost souls. As the thirteenth chime sounded, the air around me became viscous, heavy, as if the night itself was trying to suffocate me. A figure emerged from the shadows around the clock, its eyes a mixture of fire and darkness a twisted smile revealing teeth that were like shards of night. Do you know the price of knowledge, librarian? His voice was a serpent, hissing and seductive. With the truth revealed and fear staring me in the face, I responded with determination, even as I felt fear gnaw at every fiber of my being. I know the price, and I am here to renegotiate the terms of your ancient pact. The entity laughed a sound that made the surrounding air vibrate with cold malevolence. The terms are not mine to change. They were sealed with blood and promises long forgotten by mortals. But perhaps, if you offer me something of equal value, I may be persuaded to spare tonight's souls. Knowing the risk involved, I took an old watch from my pocket, part of the artifacts I found together for the watchmaker's diaries. It was a simple looking object, but within it pulsed an energy I barely understood, a relic of the early days of the pact. This is the original watch used to seal the first deal. It contains part of your ancient energy, your essence. Accept it as payment to cease your collection in this generation. The entity approached, its movements enveloped in shadows that seemed to extend and retract with a life of their own. With a pale, tremblingly precise hand, she took the watch from my hand, her eyes burning with a light that seemed to consume the very darkness around it. An interesting object, she murmured, examining the clock with voracious interest. This may satisfy the debt for some time, but remember, librarian, the cycle of debt and payments is eternal. I will return when the clock completes its next centennial cycle. With a sudden gesture, the entity vanished into thin air, leaving behind only the echo of its laughter and the clock in my hands now silently inert. Hurrying back to the central square, I saw the residents of Thorn gathering, confused and relieved, as the previously missing children began to reappear one by one, emerging from the shadows as if awakening from a long sleep. In the weeks that followed, Thorn gradually returned to her routine, each family relieved to have their children back and safe but I knew that peace could only be temporary. With each passing day, I studied the clock and ancient texts, searching for a way to break the cycle for good, so that when the entity returned, Thorn would no longer be at the mercy of its dark demands. And as I worked, the clock tower towered above me, a constant reminder of the time that passed incessantly, each tick-tock a step toward the next inevitable encounter. I knew I had only a century to find a solution or condemn Thorn to reliving the terror again. With this thought haunting every moment of my existence, I dedicated my life to unraveling the mysteries of the clock and the pact, a quest that I knew could not only define my destiny, but that of the entire city. 
As the years passed, the shadow of that night remained over me, a constant reminder of the fate that would eventually return to challenge the city of Thorn. My work at the library gradually turned into a solitary obsession. Every ancient book and manuscript scoured for a forgotten clause or lost ritual that might offer a permanent solution to the pact that tied the city to the clock. Time, however, is never an ally for those who seek to escape its clutches. With each decade, the weight of my mission grew, as did the burden of knowledge I carried. In my dreams, I saw the shadow entity, its face a veil of mystery and menace, its eyes always watching me, reminding me of the proximity of its return. As the hundredth year approached again, strange incidents began to occur in Thorn. Clocks throughout the city inexplicably stopped at midnight, regardless of their mechanical configuration. Ghostly whispers were heard in dark alleys, and children reported dreams of a tall, dark figure watching them from shadowy corners. The city, once calm, now writhed under a cloak of renewed fear, the past threatening to swallow its present. Determined to face the entity once again, I prepared myself with all the knowledge and artifacts I had collected over the decades. On the night designated for the entity's return, I positioned myself at the base of the clock tower, armed not only with the original clock, but also with a set of symbols and incantations that I hoped would reinforce the pact or ideally break it. As the clock began to strike midnight, the air around me chilled to the bone, and a dense fog formed appearing out of nowhere, enveloping the tower in an almost solid mist. The thirteenth chime sounded, more eerie than ever heard, and it came, the shadow entity, emerging from the mist like a macabre painting coming to life. You try to defy the course of fate again, librarian. Her voice was a whisper of ice, carrying with it a smell of old earth and mustiness. But you don't understand that some chains are not made to be broken. With a resolve that bordered on madness, I began the incantations, the ancient words echoing through the square like a challenge to the dark being. Each syllable trembled in the air, forming a circle of light around us. The entity hesitated, its form wavering under the influence of the enchantments, its eyes glowing more fiercely. You have found some power, human, she conceded, her form writhing within the invisible bonds of my enchantments. But will it be enough? Or does it just postpone the inevitable? The battle of wills that ensued was exhausting. With each word of the incantation, I felt my strength diminish but the determination to save Thorn sustained me. The entity struggled against its bonds, its every movement sending waves of despair through the veil that separated us from its dark domain. Finally, with a scream that tore through the night, I completed the ritual. An explosion of pure light erupted, engulfing the entity, the clock, and the entire tower. When the light dissipated, the entity was gone, leaving behind only the echo of its distant laughter and the clock in the tower, now silently inactive. Exhausted but relieved, I retreated from the base of the tower. Thorn might never be completely free from his dark past, but I had given him a breather, a chance to face the future without the constant fear of the midnight messengers. And as the city slowly awakened to a new era without the terror of the tenth, third chime, I knew my vigil would continue, always alert for any sign that the darkness might return. In the calm that followed, I, Edgar Linz, found myself in a state of constant vigilance. The city of Thorn breathed a sigh of relief, free from the clutches of the dark entity. But I knew that the price of such freedom was eternal caution. In the months that followed, life seemed to return to normal, but the marks of the past were still engraved on the stone streets and in the eyes of residents. One night, as I walked through the quiet streets of Thorn, I felt a familiar shiver run down my spine. The silence was too deep, a stillness that precedes the storm. The clock on the square's tower, now standing still, looked like a grim monolith in the pale moonlight. It was then that I heard a soft, almost imperceptible sound, a whisper among the trees, a voice that did not belong to this world. Do you think you can change destiny, Edgar? The voice was melodic, seductive, and terrible. Fog began to form, 
Slowly swirling around the base of the stopped clock, shadowy figures danced in the periphery of my vision, whispering promises of darkness and despair. I quickened my pace, trying to escape the voice calling me, but the faster I walked, the more intense the whispering became until the words were as clear as the sound of a bell. You can't escape the shadow you summoned yourself, Edgar. You have opened the door, and now it will remain open. Running now, I reached my house, locking doors and windows, turning on all the lights to ward off the darkness that seemed to follow me. But security was elusive. That night, as I lay down, trying to find some rest, a shadow passed by my bedroom window, a tall figure with eyes that glowed with an unnatural red light. In the days that followed, the city was gripped by renewed terror. Children began reporting nightmares about a dark figure watching them as they slept, and adults whispered about shadows that moved on their own. Thorn, try as she might, could not shake off the blanket of terror that enveloped her. I continued my studies, desperate to find a way to close the door I had inadvertently opened. Yet each book, each ancient scroll seemed to mock my quest, its words a mixture of warnings and riddles. One stormy night, as the wind howled like Thorn's lost souls, I was in my office when the tower clock began to chime. One, two, three, up to thirteen. The thirteenth chime sounded not only in the tower, but inside my own house. The door to my office opened with a slow creak, and the shadowy figure entered, more real and terrible than any dream or vision. Time is eternal, Edgar, and your debt is now part of it. With a scream that was lost in the roar of the wind, I faced the shadow, knowing that the true battle for Thorn's soul had only just begun. The clock continued to tick, marking not just time, but the rhythm of my destiny intertwined irrevocably with the shadows I had called. The story of the clock children was not just a legend, it was a warning, an echo of a past that would continue to haunt each generation, a lesson written not in ink but in shadows and despair. corner forgotten by maps and memories, the village of Ravensbrook hides, enclosed by dense forests and shrouded in a cloak of mysteries that the night fog insists on not unraveling. Among local legends, none is more talked about and feared than that of the plane that cuts through the skies at midnight, a specter that seems to echo the last moments of a distant era. My name is Lucas Almeida and my insatiable curiosity is what brought me to Ravensbrook. An investigative journalist by profession and an explorer of forgotten stories by passion, I was looking for something that would fuel the flame for my next big story. But when I stepped into Ravensbrook, I felt like I was delving into a plot that I might prefer not to unravel. The first time I heard the plane was on a misty night, when the full moon could barely filter its light through the heavy gray veil that covered the sky. The sound was a distant rumble, almost muffled by the thick curtain of fog, but distinct enough that there was no doubt of its unnatural origin. Planes no longer flew over those lands, not since the war. Through conversations with the residents, hunched and silent figures whose eyes revealed more fear than the welcome their words were trying to express, I discovered about the ancient airstrip, lost in the forest, a reliquary of a time when Ravensbrook still pulsed with the lives of its inhabitants, who departed and arrived from the front. Driven by a mix of fear and determination, I decided that the following night would be the one that would take me there. Armed only with my flashlight and a tape recorder, I followed the distant sound of the plane that, as legend promised, began its ghostly song at midnight. The trail was narrow, lined with trees that seemed to watch and whisper and lean as I passed as if disapproving of my intrusion. Finally, the forest opened up to a clearing where time seemed to stand still. Before me, shrouded in fog and illuminated by the silver moonlight, was the plane. An old model, one of those used in war, intact and imposing, as if it were ready to leave at any moment. 
I approached with my heart beating in a frenzy of rapid and irregular beats, each step resounding on the ground like a harbinger of misadventures. As I touched the cool metal of the plane, a wave of cold ran down my spine. The silence of the night was broken by the sound of a door opening on the plane, and a voice called my name, in a whisper that seemed full of secrets and warnings. Lucas, come, said the voice, an invitation as much as a warning. Unable to resist, I got on the plane. Inside, time had not just stopped, it had regressed. The interior was lit by soft light, the seats occupied by shadows of men and women dressed in wartime uniforms. Their pale faces turned towards me with expressions of someone who had gone through the unimaginable. One of them, a man in a pilot's uniform, stood up. His face was marked by a dark seriousness. You want to know our story, don't you, Lucas? So see and tell if you can survive the truth. The plane began to shake and the sound of engines filled the air. Looking out the window, I saw that we were no longer in the clearing, but rather flying over war-torn terrain the flames and explosions painting a picture of desolation. It was more than a historical reconstruction. It was an immersion in the vivid memories of those who had been part of that last flight. The pilot continued to speak, his voice now almost drowned out by the roar of the explosions outside. Our mission was crucial, but we were shot down before reaching our destination. And now we are trapped, condemned to repeat our last flight, night after night unable to find peace. The aircraft shook violently, replicating the movements of an aircraft hit in combat. I could hear the anguished screams of the ghostly passengers, each trapped in their own moment of final terror. The atmosphere was suffocating, the air heavy with the weight of unresolved souls, every wail and whisper of pain penetrating deep into my being. But you, alive among the dead, can free us, continued the pilot his eyes burning with an intensity that transcended time. Take our story back to the world of the living. Tell about the sacrifice that was never recognized, about the truth hidden in the shadows of history. As he spoke, shadowy figures moved around the plane, as if the night sky itself had come to life. They were specters of other planes, adversaries and allies, all intertwined in a macabre dance of eternal aerial warfare. The sound of exploding machine guns and bombs created a grotesque symphony of war that reverberated through the fuselage. The plane began to rapidly lose altitude, plunging toward the burning ground below. The pilot looked at me one last time, his expression a mix of despair and hope. Remember us, he said, before being consumed by the light that now invaded the plane, the impending explosion reflected in his eyes. In a moment of absolute terror, I closed my eyes, waiting for the final impact. But instead of the end, there was a deep silence. When I opened my eyes, I was lying in the clearing, the plane silently imposing beside me, intact as if nothing had happened. The fog began to dissipate, revealing the dawn that slowly cut through the darkness. I stood up, each movement echoing the disorientation and relief of someone returning from a nightmare. I knew what I needed to do. They had stories that needed to be told, yes, but at what cost to my own sanity? I decided to stop at a small roadside inn to rest before continuing my journey at dawn. The place was old, and the floorboards creaked with each step, as if they were whispering secrets forgotten by time. The owner of the inn, an old man with a tired look, welcomed me with a nod and a rusty key. Room number seven, upstairs and down the hall, he said, his voice as worn as the surrounding walls. The room was small and austere, with just an iron bed, a table, and a small window that looked out onto the empty road. I placed my recorder and notes on the table, determined to begin transcribing the story as soon as the sun rose. But as I lay down, the silence of the night was broken by the sound of an airplane. My heart raced. It couldn't be. It was too far from Ravensbrook to be the same plane, I thought but the sound was unmistakable, and as before, it seemed to come directly from above the inn. I got up and ran to the window, but the only thing I saw was the deserted road and the moon reflecting in the puddles from a recent downpour. There was no plane, just the sound, getting louder and louder, as if it were about to land right there. The terror that followed was palpable, 
a sense of despair and claustrophobia as the sound of the plane filled the room, drowning out my scream of terror. I closed my eyes, waiting for the impact, the fire, the end. But instead, all that came was an abrupt silence. When I opened my eyes, the stillness was total. Not just the sound of the plane, but any sound was gone. The silence was so thick, it could be touched. I got up hesitantly and approached the door to leave the room, but it wouldn't open. It was locked, not from the outside, but by something I couldn't see. The reality of my confinement fell upon me like a curse. I was trapped, a prisoner of a story that perhaps would have been better never revealed. The shadows on the walls began to move, forming silhouettes of men and women in flight uniforms, their expressions twisted into eternal screams of terror. They approached, each step resonating with the sound of a plane that never landed, of a mission that never ended, of souls that never found peace. I was among them now, part of their story, part of their eternal, damned flight. With terror consuming my every thought, I knew my only hope lay in telling this story, in passing on the legacy of those forgotten by time. But as the shadows closed around me, a cruel doubt haunted me. By releasing their voices, had I also released his curse? And now, who would tell my story? As the shadows approached, each figure a distorted reflection of agony's past, I realized that the line between the narrator and his narrative had been irrevocably erased. The room, once just small and suffocating, now pulsed with the energy of an aerial battlefield, every dark corner vibrating with the echo of screams and the roar of engines. Driven by fear and a desperate need to escape, I threw myself against the door one last time with all the strength I could muster. To my surprise, it gave way, opening with a crack that broke the silence like thunder. I stumbled out of the room, the inn's hallway stretching out before me, bathed in the flickering light of lamps that flickered as if they were breathing. I ran, the sounds of my despair blending into the echoes of those who had flown and fallen before me. Every step was a scream, every breath a silent prayer that this wouldn't be my last flight. Behind me, the sound of the plane grew louder, a constant threat that promised to drag me back into the depths of its eternal torment. Upon arriving at the inn's entrance hall, the old owner looked at me with a look that cut through the fog of fear and mystery. You heard them, didn't you? He asked, his voice a whisper that barely disturbed the charged air. They never let anyone. You are now part of their story. I swallowed hard my mind spinning as I tried to process his words. The exit was only a few meters away, but each step seemed more difficult than the last. Then the doors closed, the sound of the engine filled the space around me, and the night took me an eternal messenger on Ravensbrook's ghost flight.